Rarely is the drama of war seen more starkly than in the small ship actions of the Second World War's Battle of the Atlantic, where German submarines and the naval vessels built to fight them engaged in often lonely actions far out to sea where either vessel could easily be destroyed. The actions were short, sharp, and often terrifying for their crews. One such action represented a significant milestone, the first time a U.S. Navy vessel sank a German submarine off the coast of the United States in the Second World War, but the action was cloaked in secrecy, it was surrounded by controversy, and it wasn't even fully recounted until long after the war. The action on April 14, 1942, between the destroyer USS Roper and the German submarine U-85 deserves to be remembered. USS Roper was commissioned February of 1919, one of 111 Wix-class destroyers built between 1917 and 1921. The Wix class were among those called flush deck destroyers because they did not have a raised forecastle like on previous classes, and also called four stack destroyers for their four funnels. Like most vessels of the Wix class, Roper came too late to participate in the Great War, although she was in service soon enough to participate in post war relief activities. She also served in the Asiatic Squadron before being decommissioned and placed in reserve in 1922. Recommissioned in 1930, Roper served both in the Pacific and the Atlantic fleets. Noted science fiction author Robert Heinlein briefly served aboard Roper in 1933. In the fall of 1939, USS Roper was serving off of New England when it participated in the Neutrality Patrols. While officially remaining neutral, the ships of the Neutrality Patrol would patrol an area that Franklin Delano Roosevelt had designated as a protected zone that eventually went almost all the way to Iceland. Although at first, at least, the US ships wouldn't attack the German submarines, they would merely report their location to British and Canadian ships. At the start of the war, U.S. naval assets were spread thin and largely unprepared for the German U-boat threat. Notably, the Navy had a significant shortage of vessels specialized for anti-submarine duties. U.S. losses to German U-boats along the East Coast were extreme. The first attacks in January 1942 were made by the large, long-range German Type 9 U-boats. Those attacks were so successful and the targets so plentiful that the German Navy followed by sending smaller Type 7 U-boats as well. These smaller submarines weren't built to operate so far abroad. They had to be literally crammed front to back with supplies and use special measures even to reach the United States. But still, the U.S. defense measures were so haphazard that even the Type 7 boats found significant success off the coast of the United States. By the end of March, the German U-boats had sunk more than 60 vessels off the U.S. East Coast and thousands of tons of shipping, much of it in the part of North Carolina's outer banks ominously called Torpedo Alley. In exchange, the United States Navy was yet to sink a single German U-boat. Roper, having returned from escorting a convoy to Ireland, was patrolling Torpedo Alley, the shipping lanes between Cape Hatteras and Chesapeake Bay, one of the too few U.S. vessels trying to stem the tide of the U-boat attacks. She was under the command of 38-year-old Lieutenant Commander Hamilton Wilcox Howe, a 1926 graduate of the United States Naval Academy. The duty was hazardous. In February, the Wix class destroyer Jacob Jones had been sunk by torpedoes from the U-578. Only 10 members of her crew had survived. Roper had had close calls in the early days of the Battle of the Atlantic. She had encountered a U-boat on the surface on January 19th, but the Roper's depth charge rack had jammed and the U-boat captain had been able to escape. In March, they had made contact with three U-boats on the surface, but the Roper was alone and only had 14 depth charges available. When the U-boats pursued Roper, Howe tried to get them to separate, but when they wouldn't, he was forced to outrun them rather than engage in a battle that would have been lopsided against Roper. The Roper had rescued many victims of U-boat attacks, including 27 survivors of the steamer SS New York in a lifeboat on March 31st. A pregnant woman had given birth on the lifeboat and had given the child the middle name Roper in recognition of the vessel that had rescued them. Roper was on patrol off North Carolina's Cape Hatteras the night of April 13th. The night was described as clear, with many stars visible. The sea was very nearly calm, the water phosphorescent. Six minutes after midnight on the 14th, she acquired a radar contact, which was of a type that could have been a submarine. They weren't far from the coast, as the light from the Bodie Island Lighthouse, as well as the Bodie Island Lighted Bell Buoy No. 8, were discernible to the ship's starboard. The radar contact was then confirmed with a soundman contact, which could hear rapidly turning screws. Roper could see the wake of the vessel in the phosphorescent water 
As Roper approached within 2100 yards, it still wasn't clear what vessel they were pursuing. They said it appeared to be a small Coast Guard vessel, but its speed indicated that it could still be a submarine. And so Roper was called to general quarters, and her weapons, including 30 and 50 caliber machine guns, 3-inch naval guns, depth charges, and torpedoes, were prepared for immediate action. At that point, the target, which had apparently become aware of Roper's pursuit, started to turn to port. Roper, aware there was a danger from torpedoes, moved for a position on the target's starboard quarter to make torpedo attack difficult. It was a good choice. As they approached within 700 yards, a torpedo was observed that nearly missed Roper, passing close aboard down the port side. The Roper now knew this was an enemy, but it was not until they approached within 300 yards that the target cut sharply to starboard, and Roper's 24-inch searchlight illuminated it and identified it as a large submarine. The deck officer noted the submarine was painted with a camouflage, predominantly light in color. The submarine was the Type 7B U-boat U-85. Commissioned in June 1941, the U-85 was one of more than 700 Type 7 U-boats that comprised the backbone of the German U-boat fleet. The Type 7 was the most produced submarine type in history. The U-85, under the command of 26-year-old Oberlieutenant Zersi Eberhard Greger, was on its fourth patrol and had already sunk more than 15,000 tons of Allied shipping including the Swedish freighter Christina Knudsen, sunk off New Jersey, April 10th. Gregor had the U-85 on the surface, likely charging his batteries when it was spotted by Roper. He likely kept on the surface because the U-boat was much faster on the surface than it was submerged, and he had hoped to shake the Roper, but Roper had stayed on target. The U-85 had fired a torpedo from its aft tube at Roper, but when the torpedo missed, it became clear that the U-85 was going to have to stand and fight. Gregor was turning the submarine in order to bring her deck gun to bear. The submarine had a tighter turning radius and was turning sharply to starboard. While the searchlight kept the submarine illuminated, Roper's guns went into action. First the machine guns, and then the 3-inch battery. Forced into a fight, the submarine crew were rushing for their deck gun, but were cut down by the machine gun fire. A 3-inch gun under the command of coxswain Harry Heyman fired for its first time in combat, scored a hit on the conning tower at the waterline, puncturing the submarine's pressure hull, and the submarine began to sink, stern first. Howe ordered a torpedo attack, but the submarine disappeared before it was fired. Despite seeing approximately 40 members of the submarine's crew in the water, Roper fired a barrage of 11 depth charges over the submarine's location. In the darkness, they could not see wreckage. At the time, Roper made no attempt to rescue the crew of the U-85. Howe noted that the Roper at least twice came near survivors from the submarine. Cox and Heron, who had fired the shot that crippled the U-boat, recalled in a journal hearing the German shouting, Comrade, indicating surrender. But Hughes considered rescue attempts to be too dangerous at night because submarines were known to operate in pairs. As Heron noted, you were like a sitting duck every time you stopped to pick up survivors. Instead, Roper waited until morning when a Catalina PBY operated by the Naval Reserve arrived and could watch over the area. By then, it was 7 a.m. The PBY noted suspicious oil slicks and debris. The plane dropped a depth charge on one potential target and Roper dropped two more. More planes started to arrive, and one dropped markers called smoke floats near what appeared to be bodies in the water. Roper, now under the protection of aircraft, placed two boats in the water. As they searched, an airship arrived as well and began patrolling for evidence of more submarines. In all, Roper noted seven aircraft arrived on scene. At 10 till 8, the first boat came back to Roper with five bodies. None of the U-boat crew were found alive. An hour later, as the ship was recovering bodies, the ship made another sonar contact and dropped four more depth charges. They observed one large air bubble and one small air bubble in addition to fresh oil. The airship, whose great advantage was the ability to stay on target for longer than an airplane, kept watch of the spot and noted that bubbles continued to come up. A marking buoy was dropped on the location which, in view of the proximity of the bodies and debris, the sharp sound contact of an object which remained stationary and the large air bubbles which persisted, how assumed, was the location of the sunken submarine. In all, Roper retrieved 29 bodies, including those of two officers. Two more bodies were allowed to sink, and 15 empty life vests were found. Six escape lungs were also recovered, and at least two of the bodies had mouthpiece tubing in their mouths, indicating they had escaped after the submarine sank. Curiously, some of the bodies were wearing civilian clothes and carrying wallets with United States currency and identification cards, suggesting that part of the U-85's mission was to drop off spies. While destroying the first U-boat off the U.S. East Coast since the U.S. entered the war was significant, the U.S. was more interested in gaining intelligence from the U-85 and in keeping the German Navy in the dark as to what happened to the boat. The victory by Roper was not reported in the news. The bodies of the crew members were taken to Norfolk Naval Air Station to gather what intelligence they could find, and then were photographed 
fingerprinted, and buried with honors after dusk on April 15th at Hamden National Cemetery. The coffins were carried by an honor guard. More than a dozen officers participated in the funeral. Final rites were said by both Catholic and Protestant chaplains. Twenty-four sailors fought a three-volley salute as a bugler paid taps. But the civilians standing outside the cemetery had no idea who was being buried. The headstones only included names, not ranks, nor service branch, nor date of death. A short statement was released in July describing the burial rites, but did not include the name of the submarine, the vessel that sank it, nor the date of its sinking. The full story was not released until after the war. Howe's decision to forego any rescue attempt for more than seven hours after the vessel sank and to drop depth charges in the water despite knowing that there were survivors in the water is controversial to this day. But historian Clay Farrington of the Hampton Roads Naval Museum notes that you can't Monday morning quarterback this sort of thing. They didn't call them wolf packs for nothing. There might have been another U-boat in the water waiting to take its shot. Moreover, Harrington noted that they would have known that the crew were intelligence assets. The Roper would have preferred to have taken them alive if they could have. The U-85 sank in 110 feet of water. In the weeks after its sinking, U.S. Navy divers attempted to enter the wreck and see if they could recover the submarine's Enigma code machine, but they were unsuccessful. The submarine rescue vehicle USS Falcon also arrived and tried to salvage the U-85, but the damage to the pressure hull was too significant and they were unable to refloat the submarine. Lieutenant Commander Howe was awarded the Navy Cross for the action, and Coxon Heyman was awarded the Silver Star. Howe later achieved the rank of Rear Admiral. Like many four stackers, Roper was later converted into a high-speed transport. She served in the Mediterranean and then in the Pacific. On May 25, 1945, she was struck by a kamikaze off of Okinawa. The war ended before repairs could be completed, and she was finally scrapped in December 1946. USS Roper's anchor is on display at the campus of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The wreck of the U-85 is a popular diving destination, and while the Coast Guard is moving to protect the wreck, several items have been recovered from the wreckage by divers, including a silver tea set and the missing Enigma code machine, which is now on display at the Graveyard of the Atlantic Museum in Hatteras, North Carolina. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long, and if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.